Hi everybody. We'll um, just hang on a few minutes to, to wait until there's some people here. Um, obviously it'll uh, take a few minutes for everything to come on. Uh, now if I'm looking this way, uh, it's because uh, I'm going to have the, um, the comments. I'll be on my phone over here because I can't see it whilst I've got the PowerPoint and everything up um, on the screen. Um, but um, yeah, we're, um, we're going to get going on this. So hopefully the captions are working because they worked for a little while on the last one and then stopped. So I'm hoping they're working. Uh, it looks like they're working on my screen over here. So we're just going to uh, roll with that <laughs> and fingers crossed. Um, it will. Uh, there is a, about a minute's delay in between what I'm saying and what I can see on the comments. Um, so if um, you do have a question and I don't answer it straight away. It's either because I'm going to answer the question in what we're going to do um, or I just haven't seen it yet, um, but I will keep checking. Um, so we're just going to give it a few more minutes. There's about 12 people here now, so that's pretty good. And um, we'll, uh, we'll get going in a, in a little bit. Hope everybody's enjoying everything so far. Um, it's been it's been pretty awesome. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I enjoyed all of the last um, last conference as well, so I hope everyone's enjoying this one too. So just give it a couple more minutes and we'll get going now. Thankfully this time, um, because we've got more time, um, I've been able to do three separate talks. So I won't have to squish everything into an hour and run out of time and not say everything I needed or wanted to say about this. <laughs> and we can go into some other bits a little bit more in depth as well and have a bit of fun with it. There's going to be a little bit of audience participation. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to doing that with you guys. This should hopefully be a little bit of fun and a little bit of a learning experience. We do, Millie. Hi, girl. Millie's come to say hello. Millie, are you going to come up? Really? Where are you going? You're around the wrong side now. Up, up, up. No, she says no, I'm not coming up, but the puppy's here. Little Loomy's come to say hello. Loomy says, hi, I'm a baby. Nice to meet you. I'm going to eat grandma's headset. <laughs> so Loomy is my girl, Bella's, um, Bella's puppy. She's 13 weeks old and she's actually off to Belgium in um, in about two weeks. Well, just shy of two weeks now. Um, so she's here for a little bit longer. So I'm making the most of my little puppy squishes. Um, so if I suddenly have to run off, it's because she's decided she needs the toilet and I'm gonna have to run out um, and take her outside. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, we've got about 20 people here now. She should hopefully be quite sleepy because she's been out on an adventure this afternoon with, with me and her mummy um, down the river. So she's been having some fun. Okay, all righty. So what is a wolf dog? Um, there's a lot of answers to this. Some of them are right, some of them are wrong, and there are multiple correct answers to this as well. Um, some people uh, watching this may have experience with wolf dogs. Um, some of you may have not had any experience at all with wolf dogs. Some of you may have met um, some of specific types or breeds um, or just seen them from a distance. So we're going to we're going to kind of delve into it quite a lot. There's a lot to cover. I won't be able to cover everything, um, but I'm going to do the best I can to give you a good kind of all round picture about wolf dogs, because there's a lot of misconceptions um, and, and I want to kind of help put those right. So what is a wolf dog? In the basic sense of the term, a wolf dog is any dog that has any percentage of wolf specific DNA. Um, so this can be anything from the dog that you see there um, in my arms, which is my friend's girl Evie, um, all the way down to something like my boy Zeus, um, who literally has like 1.3%. Um, now, most people wouldn't consider him a wolf dog, but in the eyes of the law, in places where wolf dogs are illegal, he would still be considered legally a wolf dog and therefore illegal to own. Um, so this is why there are um, different answers as to what a wolf dog is. Um, and it varies depending on who you're speaking to, but we're going to address it from a legal standpoint of what a wolf dog is. Um, and a wolf dog is anything that has any amount of wolf specific DNA. Um, now, the difference between uh, wolf DNA and canine, like, like our pet 
canine DNA, dog DNA, um, is actually just a mutation in a very, very small percentage of genes, uh, which is what gives us the massive range of dog breeds we have. So the, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, I should have written this down, um, but I think it is 0.04% of their genetic code is different to a wolf. And, and that, those 0.04% of mutations, because of the same genes, they're just mutated versions, is what gives us every single breed of dog we have, which is mad um, when you think about it. But that's that's where we are. And um, we've done a lot with that little tiny amount of, uh, of DNA um, to create all the dog breeds we have now and, and in such a great variety. But that is really all the differences. They are um, classified scientifically as the same species. They're just different subspecies. So we're going to get delving into it a little bit more now. So the basics of wolf dogs. So the history of wolf dogs, um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of different um, histories of wolf dogs. Um, so the most popular and the most common wolf dogs in the world, um, because it varies from where you are, but in the world as a general, um, is what's called the American wolf dog, um, which is just a wolf dog that's been bred in America with American wolf dog heritage, um, so American wolves. Um, and originally they were bred for fur farms. Um, so obviously they, they had um, wolves, they were using for fur, they wanted the pelts. But obviously, as we know, wolves are very highly strung. Um, they, you know, they cover huge distances, have massive territories. So when they were trying to keep them in these small pens and enclosures and cages um, for their fur farms, obviously this wasn't working out very well. They would fight, they would, you know, potentially self-harm themselves and, and ruin the pelts that they were trying to sell and make money from. So they started to breed dog into them to make them more amenable to captivity and obviously easier to handle and manage as well. So that was kind of the foundation of the majority of wolf dogs. Um, some of them um, came from scientific studies as well. There were some scientific studies which um, resulted in the breeding of wolves and dogs as well, but that was a very small proportion. The majority of the wolf dogs came from fur farms. Um, and obviously then as it became more desirable to own them rather than just have them for the fur, the pet trade obviously took off with them as well. Um, and over that period of time, then obviously it became more desirable for people to have them to be a little bit more domesticated. So instead of having these animals, obviously, that were just kept in these tiny cages and raised for fur, um, we were looking at animals that then were more selected to have um, these desirable, sort of more domestic traits. And they were more handleable, they weren't as shy as strangers, they would listen to people. And obviously that varied depending on the hi everybody. <laughs> um, that varied depending on um the breeds of dog that were used. Now, stereotypically, um the majority of the breeds that were used were the wolfy-like breeds. So your Malamutes, your Huskies, your German Shepherds, because obviously when they were breeding them into the wolf, they still wanted to keep the wolf coat you know and, and the pelt that's what they were using them for originally um, and obviously over over time people have still wanted to maintain that wolfy look as well so you're going to use animals that are more wolfy looking but there are uh, crosses that have occurred with non-wolfy looking dogs as well and we're going to look at those a little bit later on um, but yeah so that's the basic history of your most um, predominant wolf dog types and um, you see a lot of them in America um, we don't see so many of that type over here in, in the UK and mainland Europe, but they are still there. Um, the two types that we tend to see um, in mainland Europe is the Czechoslovakian wolf dog and the Saar loose wolf dog. And we're going to delve into their history a little bit more later on, but they were bred from European wolves. Um, some with a little bit of American wolf in there as well um, and German shepherds. And that's all that's in them. Um, and they were developed for two very different things. One was a, a working uh, military dog and the other was bred to be a guide dog. So we'll look at those a little bit more in depth later on. So hybrids is a term that you hear that's thrown around an awful lot. Um, and it's, it isn't, isn't an incorrect term. So it is in the way that most people kind of think it is. It's like, oh, they're a hybrid. It's, you know, it's a first generation cross. Pretty much all wolf dogs in existence these days are most definitely not first generation crosses. Most of them are multi-generational. 
Now, there are some over in Europe, um, predominantly in Russia, um, that there are still a couple of people doing first generation crosses, but it's generally not very recommended. Um, it, yeah, it makes things a little bit more difficult. Um, and we'll look at that when we come to legality um, in, a, in a minute. Um, so on the screen that you can see here now, we've got a selection of different wolf dogs of different content. I know we're going to have a chat about that at the moment. Um, and what that means is how much wolf is in that dog. Now, before we had DNA tests available um, for dogs that were, well, or accurate DNA tests anyway, um, that was content was um, looked at through pedigrees, but also through what's called phenotyping. And we're going to look at phenotyping as well in a little bit. And that was how they looked at how much wolf was in an animal and therefore what content level it would be placed in. So you would have low, mid and high content. And the mid was usually split into low mid, solid mid and upper mid. And this varies on the amount of wolf that's in the animal. Now, at the moment, because we have pretty accurate DNA testing, this is usually done through looking at the percentage of wolf specific DNA in an animal. So on the screen here, we've got a number of animals that have been embark tested, which is probably the most accurate DNA testing um, for dogs on the market at the moment. Um, and you can see we've got a range here, the lowest, which is my girl there, um, Bella in the bottom right, um, who is only 16.8% gray wolf. Um, all the way up to Celine there, who's at the top in the middle, and she is 95% uh, plus grey wolf. Um, and what's also attached onto hers there is um, what's called the hybridization test. Um, now, this is done by a university, um, University of California, Davis, um, who are the only company that are recognized in US law to say, yes, this animal is not a pure wolf, it is actually still a mix of dog and wolf. Um, because when you get an animal like um, Celine there, for example, she looks like a wolf. She is genetically almost all wolf, but she is not a wolf. And in the eyes of the law, that's a very important um, distinction because owning a pure wolf is illegal in pretty much the majority of places. There's a few places in America it's not, um, but the majority of places it is illegal. Owning a wolf dog is not in most places. Again, we'll come to that in a bit because it's complicated, <laughs> as is a lot of things around wolf dogs. Um, so, so content is split between those things. So the content levels, um, it's usually 50% or below is considered a low content. Um, between 50 and it's usually about 80 to 85 is considered a mid content. And then 85 and above is what's called a high content. Um, now, high content animals should look as close to indistinguishable from a pure animal as possible. Uh, what's the name of the DNA test? The DNA test is Embark. So E M B A R K. Uh, it's a company based in America, but they ship the DNA tests all over the world. Um, all of my guys are DNA tested um, through Embark, uh, as are all of my puppies as well. So. Yes, yeah, yeah, Louise Jones, yeah, Embark. Okay, so the ethics of keeping wolf dogs. Now, this is a big grey area. Um, and it's a lot of it is down to personal um, opinion. Uh, for me, the ethics of keeping wolf dogs is that if I can provide this animal with an enriched lifestyle um, and that this animal is happy living a domesticated life, there isn't an issue with it. Um, people say, oh, but they, they're not bred for a specific job. Well, no, no, they're not. They're bred to be companions. But the majority of dogs these days are not doing the jobs that the breed was bred to do either. They are companion animals. Um, and the majority of our dogs are just companions. We might do, you know, activities with them. We might do dog sports or we might, do, you know, do search and rescue or whatever. But that's not the breed that that's not what the breed was bred to do. You know, Border Collies were not originally developed to run around an agility course, for example. Um, we do these things to help stimulate their natural drives that we've bred into them genetically over hundreds of years. Wolf dogs have the advantage of not having specific drives bred into them. So we haven't selected them to guard. We haven't selected them to herd. And um, we've just selected them for companion behavior. So in a way, it does make the well-bred ones 
um, a little bit easier actually I find um, I've had border collies um, and um, yeah my my wolfies are definitely much much easier to manage than than the border collies were um, in a lot of ways um, some ways they're not but in a lot of ways they are um, so for the ethics it, it really is a personal um, a personal sort of choice as to whether you you agree with the ethics of it or not um, for me if they're well bred and well raised there's there's not really any problem with wolf dogs and I say that because there are ones that are badly bred and badly raised and that's something we're going to look into later on and, and especially in my my other talk that I'm going to be doing which is all around raising um, lupine wolf dogs um, but you that is exactly the same problem as we have with all breeds of dog you know there are good breeders and there are bad breeders and you cannot judge the good breeders and the animals produced by the good breeders of the results from bad breeders so so obviously that's something to really consider um so we've discussed purpose the purpose is their companions but they're very versatile a lot of them can do an awful lot of things um i do loads of stuff with my guys which again we're going to get into i've got to talk about training wolf dogs um and we're going to talk a lot about what what we do what we can do um what they're capable of um and 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 how fun it is to do stuff with them to be honest it is great um and so lastly we get to legality now this is is a big topic i'm only going to touch on it very briefly because there's a lot um, especially in america there is a lot <laughs> that goes into the legality side of things um so in the uk for example you can own a wolf dog as a domesticated so like canine so as a, as a normal dog as long as they are f3 or more so felile generation three or more so that's three generations away from the last pure wolf in their line so you're talking a wolf's great grandchild um in europe there are variations on that in some some countries it's f3 some countries it's f5 um so you have to kind of look at the legalities in your area in america it's it's a minefield because america don't have um countrywide laws as it were they, they do have some but a lot of it is based on the individual states regulations and each individual state can have different regulations around owning wolf dogs whether they allow up to a certain percentage whether they look at felal generations like we do in obviously in the uk or whether they just have a blanket ban on owning wolf dogs at all so nothing you know zero percent is, is allowed um, or in very few states in America you can own a wolf and you can just have it and you don't need a license or anything else um, so so yeah <laughs> um, there's a lot of gray areas in America and you really have to look into what the laws are where you are because you can go across a state line or even a city line sometimes and the laws can change so it's really important to do your homework um, in that situation um, so uh, Laurie so no um, F3 does not have any bearing on the percentage of the animal because they are a an intra species hybrid um, so they are breeding with subspecies of themselves all of the offspring is fertile so you can breed back to higher content animals and um, you can get animals that are an f5 that are still 90 plus percent wolf so this is why percentage and felal generation are different and there's a reason why it's done on felal generation especially in the uk then it is done against percentage and we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit okay awesome yes yeah it, it's really interesting there's a lot of um genetics that you kind of have to look into with it but it, it's really interesting stuff um so the the main reason for the differences in um the legislation between percentage and felal generation is because it's not the percentage that gives you domestic behaviors as such it's the selection over multiple generations that gives you the behaviors that you want so again same as how we you know dog breeds um we spent many many years you know selecting right well we've got a litter here and this one oh this one's really good at herding right let's take that one and then this one over here this one's really good at herding and we'll breed them together and then in the next litter we'll pick the next puppy that's the best at herding and so on and so on and so on so the same happens with wolf dogs they pick the ones that display the most domesticated behaviors the most desirable you know they're sociable they respond well to training and um, they're you know they're less destructive um and we sort of select the better ones 
and then breed that down the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So that's why in the eyes of the law, generations away from the last pure wolf is far more sensible to use than the percentage of wolf specific DNA. Um, is a long and short version of it. There's a lot more that goes into it than that, but that is the basics of why um, it's done that way. Okay, so next. Oh. Okay, so the different breeds and types of wolf dogs. So we've touched on this a little bit already. Um, so we'll start with the two uh, recognized wolf dog breeds. Um, and they're recognized by the FCI, which is the International Kennel Club. We've got the Czechoslovakian wolf dog. Um, now these guys were developed um, or started being developed around the 1950s. And they were bred from working line German Shepherd. Uh, and they were bred to European or Carpathian wolves. Um, and the desire of this breeding program was to create a military working dog that would have more stamina than the German Shepherd, better scent nose, and to be able to work more independently than the German Shepherd um, on border patrol, man trailing, you know, tracking, all of these kinds of things. Um, and they were roughly there is some variation, obviously, but around 25% wolf, and the rest was German Shepherd. Uh, as you can see, they look pretty wolfy. Um, you know, they, if you look at them and, and a Carpathian wolf, they, they do still resemble them quite a lot, um, certainly more than they, they resemble German Shepherds. Um, so they've kept the, wolf, the wolf, wolfy look quite nicely, but they are still temperamentally wise, a high drive animal. They've, they've kept that drive from the working line German Shepherd, so they really need, you know, something to do. They need a job to do that. You know, they're, they are a higher drive working, working dog. Um, and obviously because of that, they're also um, a little bit what I call sharper. You know, they're, they're, if, if a situation's going bad and they've got the choice of sort of, I'm going to either stand up for myself or I'm going to get myself out of dodge, they'll take the stand up for themselves option more, more often than not, because obviously they were bred for that tenacity for the job that they were bred to do. So obviously that can make them a little bit more challenging to own as, as pets. Uh, then we've got the Sarloose Wolfhound or Wolf Dog, um, who were developed um, around the 1930s. Um, and the original idea for them uh, was that they were going to be a guide dog. Um, uh, they were, again, German Shepherd and, and Wolf. They're slightly more Wolf in there in the, in the Sarloose. You're usually looking around 35%. But there is, again, there's variation within the breed. Um, and they were, yeah, they were bred to be a guide dog. So they were less of the working shepherd, um, more of the show and pet line shepherd, um, but still, you know, still keen to learn, keen to work. Um, unfortunately, they didn't do very well as guide dogs because they were too shy. Um, they, they didn't do very well in, in new or scary situations. They just wanted to to get out of there. Um, actually, obviously you don't want your guide dog doing, um, you know, if, if something, someone drops something next to them you don't want your guide dog to turn around and drag you down the street because they're going oh that's scary um so now they're predominantly just kept as pets um they they are quite shy and, and can be quite nervous of strangers so they do need um sort of quieter you know more experienced homes generally but they're really sweet natured um and and as i say they are they're, they're still nice and trainable um, they're actually doing quite a few outcross programs with them now within the, the, the Dutch breed club, um, where they were founded, um, because unfortunately the gene pool is pretty small. So they're having obviously some health issues because of that. Um, so they're now doing some outcross, um, projects, which is quite nice. It's interesting. If you want to go and check them out, they've got it all on their, uh, the Sarloos Wolf Dog Facebook page for the Dutch club. Um, then across the middle there, we've got, um, the lupine dogs, which is, is my passion, my, my, my love in life. Um, I love these guys. Um, and there's three grades of lupines. Um, there's classics, which is what my guys are. You've got intermediates and you've got advanced. Um, and we're going to talk about them more in depth in, in a different discussion. Um, we'll, we'll go into it a bit more when I go into uh, my raising wolf dogs. But basically, they are graded not in the amount of wolf that's in them, but in the care requirements. So classic lupines will live as a normal domesticated, regular, large breed smart dog, basically. Um, they don't really require any specialist care. Intermediates do require some specialist care and advanced require the most specialist care. Um, so we grade them, you know, 
based on on the care requirements that they have not necessarily what they are um so it's, it's how they are not what they are which is is the important thing really um you know you need to be able to make sure that you you can manage the dog that you're getting it's not about how it looks it's whether you can you can manage and, and live with that animal um so yeah so that's that's the lupines and uh, they're a reasonably new breed in development we do have a breed club the world of lupines foundation and um, which again we'll talk about those a little bit later on um so they they have obviously health testing pedigrees temperament testing etc then we come to what are called the wolf alike breeds so these are breeds that are trying to develop a wolfy look without as much or sometimes any wolf in them the Tamascan is one that's growing in popularity quite a lot. Um, at the moment, there's still some variety in the amount of wolves that's in the Tamascan, but they are aiming for around 10% in the finished product of the breed. Um, they are generally um, sort of quite sled dog heavy, a lot of um, you know huskies, malamutes, things like that. Um, in the foundation animals, they were Alaskan working um, huskies um, with Czech wolf dogs um, and things like that. Um, then you've got uh, your Northern Inuits, um, which were the original wolf alike. Um, they've been around for quite a long time now. Um, I'd probably say pushing maybe 30 years or more, I think, um, when the first animals were sort of brought over. Um, and again, they're very, very sled dog heavy. They do have a good chunk of shepherd in there as well. And they were started off with, they brought over, I think it was five dogs over from America and then bred them to other dogs here in the UK. Generally, you know, huskies, malamutes, shepherds, samoids, things like that. Um, and they generally nowadays have very little wolf in them. I have seen some of the older lines with maybe sort of 10 to 12% in them, but the majority have less than about 5%. Um, some of them come back with none at all now, um, and it, it's many sort of generations removed. They're generally more sled dog in their behavior, um, though they do have that little bit of shepherd in them, which obviously helps with the trainability. Um, but they tend to be much bigger, much heavier set as well because of the sled dog in them, um, tend to have sort of curly tails and all these kinds of things. So. Um, and then from the Northern Inuit, there came several splits. So breeders fell out, um, other breeders weren't doing the right health testing and they had different opinions as to how the breed should look and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it ended up splitting several times. So the Northern Inuit, um, from them came the Utonagans. From the Utonagans came the Caledonian wolf -likes. Um, From the Northern Inuits, again, there was a, another split, came the Timber Dogs. Um, and now they do look sort of like different. If, if you look at the, the wolf like breeds, you know, next to each other, you can sort of start to see the differences, but obviously they all started from the same dogs and they've not been split that long. So they do still overlap quite a lot. Um, but yeah, there is, they, they kind of all starting to get their own little breed clubs together now. So you can see with the Northern Inuit and the Timber dog there that if you've got on the screen, you can see those differences a little bit. Timbers tend to have heavier coats, for example. Um, you know, the Northern Inuits tend to have the shorter coats, more of a curly tail. There's, you know, there are differences between them, but behavior wise, they're very, very similar because the genetic makeup is, is almost identical. Okay. But yeah, so you, you will probably see more of the wolf likes in the UK than you do see of the actual wolf dogs, but they are there and it is certainly worth being aware of them. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick check on the questions. I have an old Inuit from the UK, haven't had him embarked yet, would be nice to know if he has any wolf content, as I know some of them have a small percentage of wolf in them. Much more training. Na, 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 na. Yeah, yeah. So Louise, you will probably find he does have a small amount of wolf in him. Um, depending on what lines he's from, you know, he may may have maybe, you know, eight, nine, ten percent. He may have less than that. Um, but yeah, you'll probably find he will have a little bit of wolf in him. But he's going to be very sled heavy. Um, generally, um, husky and, and malamute are the top two, and then you get the shepherd in there, and then sort of like the wolf at the bottom. Um, um, have you heard of the American Indian dog? Um, it depends on which one you mean, because there's two. So, uh, Mara, there is the North American Indian dog, and there is the Native American Indian dog. Um, the North American Indian dog is a line of high content American wolf dogs, which has been bred by a gentleman called Mark Klemper. 
maybe pronouncing his last name wrong, um, over many, many years. He's been doing it since the 80s, where he's had a very selected breeding program to produce high content wolf dogs, but with a much more social and biddable temperament. And I've met a few of them now, I've met four of them, and they are, they're, they're nice animals. They're still high content wolf dogs. They are what they are. And they're certainly not for all owners, um, for sure. But yeah, they're a nice sort of solid uh, line of wolf dogs, but you do pay a pretty penny for them as well, because He's the only guy that, that kind of breeds them. Um, the Native American wolf dogs um, were, or and are, um, a little bit of a dodgy one. Um, in my personal opinion, there's been a lot of um, misinformation about them. Some people have been told they don't have wolf in them when they very clearly do. Um, and there's, some of them have been tested to have wolf come back to them. And the breeder has sold them into states in America where wolf dogs are illegal because she's gone, oh, yeah, there's no wolf in these. They're, they're you know, they're a Native American Indian dog. And they're not. They're, well, I mean, they, that's what she's decided to call them, but they're still a wolf dog. Um, and yes, yeah, so, and it's caused a lot of problems. So, um, so yeah, those are the two types. You've got your North, what are called your North AIDS, and then your Native American Indian dogs. Um, and they're two very different things. Um, and if you get them mixed up in, in the wolf dog groups, you'll get shouted at. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's those two. But they're both types of American wolf dog. And this is why the American wolf dog on there is, is sort of like put in brackets, because there is a huge amount of variety in the American wolf dogs. They aren't a set breed. They don't have a breed standard. It's just people in America who are breeding wolf dogs. Some of them are doing it really well. Some of them are really, really not. Um, and unfortunately, because there's no breed club, there's no one to sort of go, well, you can't call them this because they're not, because they're just they're just a mix, basically. And they can be a mix of all sorts of things. So, and that's something we're going to come on to now. So for American wolf dogs, what is very commonly used to differentiate whether they are mid, um, low, mid or high content wolf dogs, or whether they're wolf dogs at all, um, is what's called phenotyping. So if you can't get DNA tests, or if you haven't had your DNA test done yet, then you start looking at phenotyping now. It's not an exact science. It takes a lot of practice to do. And some of it you can't do unless you can get hands on the animal or see them moving. But we're going to have a look at some pictures and we're just going to have a little practice. So we want some audience participation now. Um, I'm going to bring up some pictures. We're going to go through some details first and then we're going to bring up some pictures and I'm going to get you guys to have a go at doing a little bit of phenotyping, picking up some traits um, and seeing what we can see about the animals that we've got. Okay. So phenotyping is a evaluation of physical traits, behavioral traits, and biological patterns. Now, for what we're going to be doing, we're only really going to be able to look at the physical traits, although I do have some um, biological um, information about the animals in, in the pictures as well to help. But we're going to be looking predominantly at the physical traits. So. On my screen right now, I've got some wonderful um, infographics drawn um, by a fantastic artist, and I really can't remember her name, but I will, I will put it in the uh, in the comments later on um, with a link to her stuff because she's done some brilliant work about looking at the differences um, in the phenotypical parts of, of low, mid, and high content animals. I'm just gonna get the drink as well. low contents as you would imagine as they have predominantly more dog specific dna than they do have wolf specific dna are going to have more dog traits so and the, the pictures are great great sort of demonstrations there they tend to hold themselves a little bit different um, to a wolf would so they're more upright the heads are up um, and they're more sort of like almost alert looking um, they tend to have uh, not very thickly furred ears. Um, so you can usually see like the pink inside their ears. Um, you can quite often get blue eyes if they're mixed with breeds with blue eyes. So huskies, for example, one of the massivest things you'll get is, oh, it's got to be part wolf. It's got blue eyes. And it's like, no, 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 wolves don't have blue eyes. <laughs> well, I lie. There is um, a couple of very tiny um pockets that there have been a couple of recordings of one or two animals with the odd blue eyes but it's usually down to lots of inbreeding and or possibly breeding with dogs within the populations because they're very cut off populations from the rest of, of the wolf population um, but gen generally speaking rule of thumb wolves do not have blue eyes if it's got blue eyes it's it's not a wolf um, and there's a good chance it's got more dog in it than wolf 
um, large pointed ears. Um, so proportionally to their body um, and their skull especially, wolves have, um, especially when they're in winter coats, smaller ears. Um, and they are very, very thickly furred, like to the point of like you can't see the skin inside. Like it's, it's just like solid fur. And we'll, we'll see that in some of the pictures a little bit later on. Um, and very defined marking, so very strong um, masks, facial marking, things like that. Um, the, the sort of like the marks in between where the legs and the colour changes, their stomachs, their chests, um, they have sort of very defined lines. Um, also, they tend to have smaller feet. They tend to pick up more of the traits of the dog breed within them. So they will have, you know, broader chests. Um, deeper chests as well. That's something that's really important to look at, um, is that when you're looking at where the chest finishes on, on a, an animal, wolves' chests finish um, like at or above the elbow. Um, and if you look at the pictures underneath the little chart there, um, you can see on both of the animals um, in the middle picture that their, their legs are very long and their chests stop at their elbows. Now, most dogs' chests finish below their elbows. They have a much deeper chest cavity. Um, also, tail positioning as well. Um, wolves have drop tails. They don't have curly tails. So again, if there's a lot of curly tail going on there, usually a sign that there's sled dog, husky, things like that in there. So when you start looking at your mid contents, then you start seeing less dog traits and you'll see more wolfy specific traits. Um, so you will see longer legs. You will see um, quite often a lower, lower held head. So they drop it down um, big feet, usually drop tails. Um, they can have less defined markings. They can have more defined markings. So because these are a midpoint, there can be a bit of both in there so you can get sort of like traits from both sides you can still get blue eyes on mid contents i know it says you can't um but you can it's just less likely um traits that are more dominant in dogs you will still see in mid contents traits that are less dominant in dogs and um, you will see obviously less in mid content animals um your, your ears again can be bigger or smaller the other thing to be aware of with ears as well is just be aware of the subspecies of wolf that's in the animal european wolves have larger ears than the american um, subspecies do so that's something to think about when you're looking at your czech wolf dog mixes and your sarloose wolf dog mixes um, and some of the the russian wolf mixes that are, are sort of slowly making their way over as well um, they do tend to have a little bit of bigger ears but they're still very thickly furred so that's just something to be aware of and then with your high contents um as we've said before they should look almost indistinguishable from the wild animal itself um, so you'll have really well blended masks um, you won't have defined you know changes in coloration you'll have those really long legs you'll have the drop tails um, you'll have you know the, the low slung held necks those elbows you know down below the uh, down below the chest massive massive feet um, wolf feet proportionally are enormous <laughs> compared to the rest of their bodies and obviously this is you know for traveling over rough terrain and things like that um you know and they they have uh, non-defined stops um so a stop is where the uh, nose comes out on a dog so if you've got like a really defined stop like that that's a very doggy trait nice gradual stop um that's what you have in your wolfies um their coats as well um vary dramatically um from spring um uh, from summer to winter so the winter coats are these huge thick fluffy things it's what makes wolves look huge when actually structurally they're not very big animals at all they're very tall but there's not a lot to them they're they're very um very light framed indeed um it's only those really thick dense coats that make them look big um so when you see them in the summer it's a really dramatic change um in how they can look so if we look at what we've got underneath there we've actually got what was an accidental mating between um, a wolf and a labrador so you've got your labrador on your on your left there purebred lab and the white animal in the picture is a wolf and that's the, the mother to the black animal and the black animal there in the picture is half wolf half dog um, and if you look at the way that animal is 
you can very easily tell, despite the fact that it still has lopped ears from the Labrador, because drop ears is, is a dominant trait, um, and its coat's obviously not quite right, you can still see the wolfy traits in that animal very, very strongly. Um, the way it holds itself, the way it moves, the way it's structurally put together. Um, it's got a bit of a deeper chest, obviously, from the lab, but it's still, you know, proportion wise, still quite shallow. Um, it's got that shorter tail that finishes before the hocks. Um, you know, and, and it looks if you, you know, if you gave it pointy ears and a thicker coat, you, you, you know, you wouldn't be far off thinking it was a wolf. So this is where we need to be really aware of traits. And a lot of the time people get put off by superficial traits like coloration um, instead of looking at the actual physical traits of the animal. So the physical layout of the animal um, is far more important than the color because color, um, as we know, color genetics, it, it's really easy to get dominant colorations that aren't natural wolfy colorations um, because of the way genes work with breeding. So um, it, it's something to kind of you might sort of instantly look at an animal and go, oh, that looks quite wolfy because it's got the gray coloration, you know, your stereotypical gray wolf, um, when actually it, it's not, if you look at the way it's put together, it's not a very wolfy looking animal. It could have a really broad chest and, and sort of low legs and things like that. And um, one of my girls is, is a prime example of this, um, Toki. She's my oldest girl. She's 10 years old now, but she gets, oh, it's a wolf, it's a wolf comments all the time and she's hardly got any wolf in her she's really really super low con she's about like five percent um but people see that coloration um and the way she walks because she does walk she's you know low head um low slung head tails down usually um and people oh, wolf, wolf, wolf. But if you look at her she's got a broad chest and um, from the sled dog in her she's got short little legs from the sled dog in her and um, her tail's quite often curly again from the sled dog in her um so people are quite often put off by the coloration whereas my other girl millie who we're going to look at a little bit later on who does have more wolf quite a lot more wolf in than toki um gets called a german shepherd all the time <laughs> even though when you look at her structurally she's not and doesn't look anything like one um so we're going to have a bit of practice now. I've got three animals and I want you guys in the comments to tell me um, what you think they are. So whether you think they're a, a mid content, a high content or a low content. And I want you to try and point out um, some of the traits that make you think that. OK. So I'm going to get the first picture up. Now, those of you that know this dog will know what she is, um, but if you do, don't give it away, um, but still try and play along, point out the traits that are making you say uh, what you think she is. Um, and I'm just going to run off whilst you do this and have a little look. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'm just going to go and take the puppy out for a wee because she's just woke up. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> okay, so we've got two guesses on there so far both of which are saying hi. Okay. We'll give it just another minute or two to see if anybody else wants to have a guess. Cool. More. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. So we've got a bunch of guesses there. Everyone guessing high content. You're all correct. Um, Evie, yep, genetically um, is around 94% wolf and she is 6% Great Pyrenees. Um, and yes, some of you, uh, we've got loads of really great points on here. So we've got, yes, those really long legs in proportion to body. Um, you can see here, 
where her chest finishes and her elbows are way down here. So her chest is much obviously higher up. Um, now she's in, she's, she's sort of like halfway between winter and summer coat there. In her winter coat, her chest does look like it finishes lower down. Um, and that's just because the fur gets so thick. So this is why I said sometimes you have to get hands on these animals to be sure. Um, but obviously on an animal like Eve, um, there is no mistaking that she, she you know, she is a, a high content animal. She is mostly wolf and very little. Um, very little dog in there but she's a wonderful dog she actually comes out to a lot of events with us um she's really social she loves people um and she's actually expecting her first lot of babies um very soon we're very very excited um about that uh i can't wait to meet them <laughs> so we're going to be following that um with um great interest um you can't see her feet very well but her feet are huge she has proper big you know her paws are like the size of my hands um again yes no stop small ears really thickly furred um that really beautiful black eye line around her eyes they're slanted as well at the angle um she's got nice tight lips her tail, the fluff is obviously slightly longer, but her tail finishes before her hocks. Um, so yeah, the way she's holding herself, her head is down. So although she's very alert, she's looking at something, she's not head high like a dog would be. She's head down, she's, she's, she's concentrating. Um, so fantastic, well done everybody. Um, she is, she is a high content. And um, behavior traits wise, because I know, I know Evie, um, obviously, um, the biological behavior patterns with her um, that also point to the fact that she is a high content wolf dog is she only comes into spring, into season in the spring. Um, she well, is not fertile any of the rest of the year. So they stick to the very natural breeding cycle. And for high content male wolf dogs, that is also the case. Um, they generally are only fertile in the spring when the females would be in season. The rest of the year, um, the testicles actually shrivel up to little little tiny peanuts um, and are pretty useless. And obviously in the breeding season, they swell up. And this is where that winter wolf syndrome um, gets thrown around a, a lot. It's not, it's just the hormones. It's like it's breeding season um, and the hormones are kicking in basically. Obviously with dogs, they have them all the time. So we don't see any massive changes. Um, but with these guys, obviously it's a pretty dramatic change for them. So that is why you get that that sort of like phrase passed around really, but it's just breeding season, that's all it is. Okay, um, so behavior wise, Evie doesn't actually really act that much like a uh, high content wolf dog. She's not shy of people. And this is because she's well bred. Um, so she's part of um, a breed, you know, obviously that's been selected for um, more desirable and um, domesticated traits basically so she's she's people social um she is reasonably trustworthy in the house you know she's toilet trained she um she you know she she enjoys training she's she's reasonably motivated to to work with people um she's not shy she's not neophobic um she does still have some behavioral traits that are very um typical for a high content um so she's pretty same sex selective she is um especially with dogs outside of like her family unit it's very dog selective um you know she's not gonna you know drag you down the street to eat them but she doesn't really want to be friends with them either um which you know we we find with a lot of dog breeds as well so it's not the end of the world um she's an escape artist obviously she needs secure containment um you know and she will be a bit destructive you know she will chomp on stuff with her mouth and um, you get bits of resource guarding and things like that. So there are, are traits that uh, can make them obviously more challenging. OK, right. Our next animal. What about this guy? He's a lovely looking boy, isn't he? So what do you think? I'll give, again, I'll give you a couple of minutes and again, tell me what what traits. Now, I've, I've also this one may throw you with a little bit of a curveball. Uh, and I'll explain why once you've had some guesses. Um, don't eat my welly, you little monkey. Are you being a trouble? Are you being a little trouble? Come here, little trouble. Ooh. Come and sit up here with Grandma for a minute. Lumi's going to come and supervise. OK, 
Okay, so we've had a couple of guesses. Yeah. You're back on the floor now, little squishy. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so again, the majority of people, in fact, pretty much everybody's got it right. Um, this is Kraken, and he's a mid content, although he is like on the higher end of a mid content, and this is why it's thrown you for a loop. Um, so he is 71.4% um, wolf, uh, he's 21.8% German Shepherd, and 8.6% what they call unresolved. It's like a few breeds in there, but they're this, there's that small of an amount of them they can't tell them apart very well um so the reason he's a little bit different is he's actually um european um origin wolf dog in his mix so that's why he's got those slightly bigger ears as well um although they're not very well furred as you can see you, you can see the pink inside them so that's a giveaway the defined markings um again um, which obviously is, is a giveaway there. So he's got quite a defined mask. Um, and yeah, he does have that sort of like, he's, he's a bit more upright in his posture with his, his sort of like behavior, but he is, he's, um, yeah, the ears, yeah, the ears are the biggest giveaway and, and his coloration. Um, so he is still quite a lot more wolf than he is dog, but you can definitely pick out the doggy traits in there. You can tell he's not an actual wolf. Um, but, you know, he still looks very wolfy. Um, but again, he, you know, behavior wise, he lives in the house. He's he's pretty good. Um, he still obviously needs management. He he actually is more shy um, of strangers, is a little bit more neophobic than Eve is. Um, but he's, um, yeah, you know, he, he's obviously still got quite a lot of wolf in there. So lovely. Pretty much everybody got that one right. Again, you can't see his feet super easy, but you can see that they are quite large. Um, so he's got those big feet as well. Fantastic. So predominantly wolf with some German Shepherd. Um, and then I think the rest is probably a little bit of sled dog, but it, it doesn't tell us for sure on there. Okay. All right. And then this is the last one. Again, if you know this dog, don't give it away. <laughs> some of you should know this dog. <laughs> but have a little look at her. See what you think. Yeah, she has Vicky. I, I'm, I'm very proud of her. She's there. She's a lovely girl. Okay. Okay, so we've got a little bit more of a mixture um, of, of responses on this one, although most of you have got it right. Um, so this is my girl, Millie. Um, so she is, is what would be considered a low content. She's, she's a pretty low content, actually. She is 63% um, German Shepherd, um, and she's 22% uh, wolf with some Malamute, um, some Husky, Akita, um, and Rough Collie actually um, in there as well. Um, now, the reason that she's thrown a few of you is because structurally, she actually has done very well to retain a lot of wolfy traits. She has very, very long legs. Um, her chest is very shallow. Um, it, her, if, if she wasn't walking, you would, see, well, in fact, you can see if you look at her rear elbow, it is down below her chest level. 
She's got a really nice long neck. She carries herself in a very wolfy manner as well. But yes, her tail um, is a little bit, she gets a little bit of that German Shepherd kink on the end, little curl. Um, she's got those big ears. They're actually quite well furred. What you can see inside them is actually white hair, um, not pink, um, but they are big. <laughs> she's got big, big ears. Um, her skull also is comparatively smaller as well, uh, which makes her ears look even bigger. Her coat also is very shepherdy. Um, but yes, yeah, she's got that really nice, she's still got a very wolfy posture. Um, she does also actually have pretty big feet. They're not as big as a higher content would be, but she still does have pretty large paws uh, in proportion to the rest of her. Um, she doesn't have a very strong stop. Um, she still actually has quite a gradual stop there. Um, it's kind of hard to, if I was to put pictures side by side, you would see it a little bit better. Um, but she, yeah, she still has a pretty gradual stop there. Her stop certainly wouldn't be uh, part of what makes her look less wolfy. Um, she is also black, um, but something again that's very unusual for something that's got as little wolf in her as Millie does um, is that she's actually started to phase, which means she's starting to, to get more and more and more white on her. So when she was a puppy, she was pretty much all jet black, then a little white bit on her chest and some little white tips on her paws and that was it. She's now got white all here. Uh, in fact, I'll see if I can get her to come over so you can see her. Millie, come here, sweetheart. <coughs> Millie, Millie. Oh, she's coming the other way. <laughs> of course she has. Come this way, Mills. Come here. You gonna come up? Up, up, up. Come in. It's just like, what are you doing, mommy? I'm not supposed to jump up past you at the table. Get down, puppy. Come here. Millie, up, up. There we go. So if you look under her chin, she wants to turn around all of this gray here and you can see it all on her face as well this is all new um this has only been coming in in about the last six months or so um and it's spreading um but yeah you can see these bits in her ears actually are the white as well it's not pink um so yeah so millie is a low content um so behavior wise like she acts um yeah um she acts very um normal dog basically um she um you know she she's she's social she's friendly she gets on with other dogs she's non-destructive in the house she doesn't need special containment she can go off a lead she acts like a normal dog basically um which obviously is nice she is she's beautiful i love her <laughs> she's my little mini monkey um but yeah so so she is obviously a very low content wolf dog she's she's a, a classic lupine so, so that was a bit of fun for you. So I hope you've learned a little bit there and what to look out for. Um, so we're going to carry on now. So care requirements. So it, it varies dramatically depending on what kind of wolf dog you have, as we've discussed. Um, because I've got to cram this in because I'm still running out of time. Um, containment, obviously, is something that really needs to be thought about. Again, depending on what kind of wolf dog you have, depends on what containment you need. Some of them will need a proper secure as you can see there, you know, with a roof on it and everything containment, some of them, you know, they'll they'll be quite happy in, in your normal garden. Um, that picture there on the bottom right is actually my back garden. And the only thing I've had to do is the wall around the garden is only five foot high, um, which, you know, most athletic large dogs could could get out of. Um, so we've just had to put some lean ins on it. That's all. And um, so they don't think about jumping out, but they're very social. They're very friendly. Um, you can see them there. That's us at Dogfest um, a few years ago now, um, because obviously there was no Dogfest last year, um, and they're quite happy to get belly rubs off of people. And there's, there's, you know, there's literally hundreds of dogs and people at these events, and they're absolutely fine with them. Um, so behaviour varies dramatically depending on what wolf dog you're looking at. And it's something to be really, really aware of. People fall in love with the look of the high content wolf dogs um, and the advanced lupines, but they are a lot more work and people need to be very very aware of that um, they can still be trainable and they can still you know live a domesticated life and go for walkies and things like that but um, it takes a lot more work to get them there and something that you should really be looking for is breed registries um, so world of lupines foundation is the one for the lupine dogs guys Sorry, the puppy and Millie are now playing very loudly. <laughs> um, is one where it's very, very strict in terms of um, behavior requirements of the animals that are registered. Um, 
keeping track of pedigrees, health testing, DNA testing, all of these kinds of things. So realistically, you want to be looking for a breeder that has somebody to answer to, you know, someone that's holding them to this high standard and they're not just breeding willy nilly with whatever they've got available. Um, but yeah, we're going to get more into breeding and breed registry in the next talk as well. So I won't go too much into that. And the last bit is training and enrichment. Um, and I've got another talk again about wolf dog training. Um, so I've got another two talks after this. So training methods, all positive based um, is everything that I use and everybody within wolf uses. And you can see on there, we've done a bunch of things. We do heel work to music. We've got hoopers on there. Uh, I do dry land mushing with my boy. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff with them. Um, it's just a case of training them. But there is um, like, like, you know, Sean was saying earlier on about the big dogs. It's the same with wolf dogs. There is a very old school mentality of, you know, keep them in a containment. They don't go out for walks. They're not handleable. You can't do this. You can't do that. The reality is you can. You can do loads of it. You've just got to put the work in to train them. And a lot of people don't. Um, yeah, there's you, Debbie, teaching me hoopers <laughs> with Bella. Um, Bella. Bella has tried her paw at so many different things. It's great. She's a really versatile dog. It's wonderful. But yeah, there's, and it's predominantly, again, in America, uh, in Europe, wolf dogs have been seen as just another type of dog for a long time. Um, whereas in America, they've kind of become these sort of status symbol lawn ornaments that live their life in containment and never leave it. And it's not a case of the animals wouldn't necessarily be capable of going out and living a normal domesticated life. It's just their owners don't want to put the effort in to do that with them. Um, or they've been bred by people who have been pretty um bad in their selection processes and they've bred animals that are really skittish and nervous together and obviously that's caused you know genetic behavioral issues there so it's something that's really you've got to really be sure what you're getting and be able to work with it and put the effort in is is the big thing there but we're going to talk about lots and lots more about training and, and things like that um in the other talk and lastly exercise um they actually need a lot less exercise than most people think. <laughs> They're pretty lazy, to be honest. My guys get about 45 minutes in the morning um and they're, they're kind of done you know they they will just sleep all day after that um and they get to like they'll have a run on our field and then we'll go for a walk on our leads around the park and we come home and they're quite happy if i wanted to go out all day and go biking which i do with them again you can see my two girls there with me on the bike and we bike and things like that they're very happy to do it and they enjoy it or you want to go out hiking all day or something they love it but they don't need it. And this is where I was talking about before about them being bred for a job. They're not, so they don't have that massive drive. The Czech wolf dogs obviously are the exception to that. Um, but um, yeah, the majority of them, is, the lupines especially, bred for to be in domestic pets. So their, their sort of energy requirements are, are pretty low, but they do like a lot of mental activity. And that's where training comes in and we'll cover that in uh, my talk on Monday. Um, so I have overrun by three minutes. I still couldn't fit everything in. <laughs> I'm still rushed at the end um, because it is a massive subject. Um, but there's lots of information out there. I strongly recommend you checking out the World of Lupines Foundation website. There's a bunch of information on there. Um, and also we've, we've got groups on Facebook and things like that as well. Um, you can check out you know, my kennel page if you want to, the Cook on My Lupine Dogs. There's videos of me doing all sorts of stuff with my guys on there as well. Um, and you know the training that we do and the methods that we use but it, yeah it's all force free um, because if you use harsh methods with wolf dogs they're just not going to do anything for you and they're just going to shut down and they're just going to not engage and that's not what you want um, they don't respond very well to them at all um, it's all got to be you've got to you've got to get them to want to work with you and that's the fun thing so, but we'll talk about that more in the training talk on, on Monday. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. If you do have any questions, um, please fire away. Um, I will answer them in the comments because I've already overrun and you guys should go and check out all the other speakers talks. So it's been a pleasure. Um, and yeah, I will see you on Sunday um, for some more wolf dog talk where we're going to talk about raising puppies, which is always exciting um, and very, very sweet. So enjoy um yeah go and enjoy all the rest